All right. Hey guys, welcome back to another Coffee and Critique screencast. I'm Yosef Edest of 52 Frames. And this week I was absolutely floored for week 24 depth of field. Some astonishing photos from the community. You guys really pulled out the stops. A lot of nature and uh, animal photography, let's call it. Um, and some really stunning colors and compositions, and of course, beautiful blurred out backgrounds because of the depth of field. Uh, I just want, before we begin, to quickly give a shout out to our amazing 52 Frames patrons. Uh, since our last screencast, we have 10 new people that have become uh, patrons to help support the community. Thank you so much. I want to give a shout out to Gila, Tony, Sharon, Simone, Samantha, C, Angela, Eileen, Janice, and Louise. You guys, thank you so much for uh, your vision, for your support, for the community. It goes a very long way, and I'm excited to reach further towards our goal of uh, being able to hire development and make this project available uh, on our very own website where we can do all sorts of really great stuff like sorting by exit, following your friends, uh, etc. So I just want to thank you guys so much. Thank you to all of our patrons for believing in the project, believing in my vision, and it really allows me to continue doing the work that I do to keep 52 frames going week after week. Okay, so... Uh, in case you missed, I did do a full screencast on depth of field, which was linked to in the last email that went out. Uh, but a quick recap, a uh, quick explanation of what depth of field is. Depth of field is basically, uh, it's accomplished by uh, the following three things will affect your depth of field. One is aperture, that most people know. Uh, the lower the number or the wider the aperture, the more the shallower your depth of field, the more blurry your background will be. Uh, the other is focal length. So the longer the focal length, the more you're zoomed in to your subject, the more you will blur out the background, the shallower your depth of field, meaning the shallower the plane of focus will be. The third one, which people aren't as much aware of, is the distance from the camera to the subject. So the closer you are to the subject, the shallower your depth of field. The further away you are from the subject, the wider your depth of field, meaning more things will be in focus. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe not. Depends on what you're shooting. Uh, so what's interesting that I I'm not going to talk about depth of field too much because this challenge brings an interesting opportunity to discuss something that's much clearer when using a shallow depth of field, and that is a color palette. I am going to discuss color uh, and in general, just go over some photos and give some general tweaks. Let's dive into some examples and I will give some thought bombs. Drop some knowledge bombs. So first of all, I pulled out a bunch of photos here that most of the critiques were exposure issues. They were slightly too dark or not bright enough. Um, you know what? I'm going to pull up a bunch of them and just show you one by one. And maybe you can see the difference between a well-exposed shot, a perfectly exposed shot, and something that's just slightly underexposed. This is a big problem that I see in 52 frames. This was a big problem that I saw in my own photography when I started out. I don't know why. I thought that um, underexposed shots looked nicer. I thought they looked a bit more elegant, more softer, and you're not creating elegance or softness. You're just creating darkness, people. Uh, I did go through histograms in previous episodes. You can see here this right portion of the histogram is what represents the data in the lights and the highlights. And if I scroll through these photos, we can see this area of the histogram is missing on almost all of them. You can see a clear slope, very present in the darks and the shadows, and then it falls down once it hits that uh, lighter region. So it's a very simple fix, people. Uh, you Go to our exposure slider. Right now I'm in Adobe Camera Raw, but you can use Lightroom and Photoshop and other editing software in very much the same way. All 
editing software will have an exposure slider and we're just going to amp it up and we could see it's like somebody turned on the lights we see our histogram is more balanced now uh, another way I would do it is boost the mids I like to do this with a uh, a levels adjustment it's a bit more balanced that way uh, but you're accomplishing the same thing and if you just look at the before and after here all I'm doing is lifting up the exposure now this is an interesting one because I'm lifting the exposure but what am I doing if I turn my highlight clipping warning here I'm creating clipping because there's super white uh, highlights here from the Sun well that it's not necessarily a bad thing because what's the subject here the subject is are these young gentlemen over here in the foreground so their faces need to be well exposed not over here this portion of the photo where the Sun is leaking through so sometimes you do need to raise the exposure to rate this is a very good example where you're raising the shadow you're creating some fill light because your foreground is in front of the Sun now the consequence of that is that you're gonna be clipping or blowing out your highlights in the background but that's what needs to be done here to balance out the exposure to properly expose your subject um, just slight tweaks I mean to me to my eye it's it's very obvious it's very apparent and I think it really takes some practice uh, to to start to see the difference between something that just needs a boost and something that is well exposed but I'm just gonna go toggle before and after and hopefully you can see the difference and all of these are very similar just a slight boost look at this histogram over here it's going from in the shadows and now it's balancing more to the right you, you know you could you could even stretch it more uh, but just a little bit of lift and these photos really start to shine okay that was one go away cancel all changes yeah yeah cancel all changes um, let me delete these that was one critique I had that was uh, very much across the board um, let me bring these up and I'll just go through them one by one very quickly here is another example this one you'd have to be more subtle right because if I amp this so we have proper exposure on our face we really are amping the background a bit too much so for here I would probably amp it just a little bit and then I would take a brush and really just the shadows and a little bit of whites and just brush on your subjects face maybe a drop of exposure uh, we'll just show you before and after and again the same concept here's a, a very common mistake and not necessarily a mistake but it's inherently flawed in using on-camera flash this is just a very clear indication of on-camera flash or flash right on top of the camera you're getting very harsh shadows uh, and you get a very bright subject in front of you and the light fall off is very very uh, short and you're getting a very dark background so an easy fix to do in uh, something like Photoshop it doesn't have to be Photoshop but just to raise the exposure in the background I can also take a gradient filter tool and make it brighter in the background now, obviously your photo will start to degrade I'm doing this very quickly you should really take a brush and avoid getting this this stick over here um, not a great job that I did but I just wanted to show that this looks a little bit more balanced whereas here the background was dark and it's just a very clear indication of an on-camera flash which does tend to look amateur and at the very least if you can balance out I mean I went too much here but if you could just balance out the um, the exposure from the background it will give you a better look okay so with the rest of our time I wanted to go and go through some really good photos uh, these are more good examples as opposed to things that I would critique uh, that I pulled out because I was very impressed with the color palette now I, I took one painting class in college uh, which I really opted into because I thought it would be fun it had nothing to do with my major and I remember 
that the teacher went on and on about your palette, about how the colors in your painting need to match. They need to complement each other. They need to work with each other. They need to have a theme from frame to frame. And that lesson carried into photography for me. And it's difficult because you're walking down the street, you see a cool car, you pick the camera up to your eye and you, you snap it. But now you look at the photo on your computer and you're noticing that there was a pink bus and there was a woman with a a red umbrella and there was a guy with a brown jacket and the sun was like this and the building was like that and your colors are all over the place. It is something to keep in mind. Uh, obviously sometimes that's why a lot of street photography is black and white. It's about the subject. It's about the light interplay with the shadow. It's not so much about the colors. Um, but this type of photography, when you're zooming in on a subject, because again, like I said in the beginning, zooming in will affect your depth of field. So a lot of these are zoomed in. A lot of these are close to the subject, right? That was number three of what I said. And a lot of these are aperture, super wide apertures, which means you're really getting this blurred background. You're getting this shallow depth of field. And what's important is to mind your background. And what I like about these photos that I pulled out is... It's not just about the subject. This subject is a very cool looking pink flower thing. Uh, I am seeing some artifacts here. It does look like this looks quite crunchy. You could see even more in the uh, in the blurred aspects of it. I hope you guys are watching this in HD. Otherwise, you're not going to be seeing this as clear clearly. Um, but that's not what I wanted to critique. What I wanted to show was that it's the purple in the background that is bringing out this purple and pinks in the foreground. I, I would even go closer in. Now this, this green space over here, or this green space over here, is perhaps detracting from this color palette. Perhaps, I'm not saying no, because I like it. I like the green, I like the green over here. Um, but I think it's much easier to see in these types of photos this is really a fascinating photo where Jedra, beautiful job, where uh, Jedra, for example, here, she paid mind to the background. It's very hard to do with uh, a fast moving insect, but we're only seeing green, variants of green. We have light green over here. We have dark green over here. And it's this mesh of green that's bringing out First of all, the green highlight in this insect that you see, and also this brilliant blue. If there was a purple flower here in the corner, I would say that that's de detracting from the composition. That would be my critique. So the fact that it's green end to end, that is what's bringing out the subject. This is a very cool one. Also, filling the frame with your subject, filling the frame with your scene. This alien is 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 walking into the frame which i really like it's actually walking away from the camera but walking into the scene we see this space here that he's walking into sorry he or she and again because there's no other elements here it's frame to frame with the same subject it's the same story we're in his story we're in his world and although this isn't a very colorful photo there is a beautiful color palette happening here. It's a beautiful neutral green and gray, and that's bringing out the brown that's contrasting this insect thing. I'm always afraid to say things because there's, of course, going to be like a, a entomologist or I don't know what it's called, <laughs> insect expert that's going to yell at me that that's not an insect or something. Um, complementary colors, uh, blue and orange. I, did I pull out there's an even better blue and orange? Yeah. Gorgeous. I mean, this is, you're really paying mind to color palette here. This, this right here is bothering me a bit, this bright spot of yellow. And it's not just the highlight aspect of it, but it's the fact that it's suddenly a, a lack of color in an otherwise beautifully luscious color scene. Um, but you spotted the blue. I mean, you crafted this background. The background is as important as the foreground. This gorgeous, smooth scene is not just because 
you're getting these pretty flowers. It's not just because you're getting this narrow sliver of focus because that was the challenge. But you crafted your background here. This background is blue, frame to frame, beautiful negative space, both top and bottom. You very much framed the background as much as you did the foreground. That's why this foreground, you're allowing this foreground, foreground to shine, this foreground subject to shine, which is white. Um, speaking of, Al, this is gorgeous because you darkened the background. Now, I, I don't think you did that in post. I think you're shooting what looks like midday sun, which is not an ideal time, but you're creating, you're, you're capturing the contrast with the raindrops here, the direct sun that gives you the contrast almost looks black and white. If we zoomed in on this flower, you would think it's a black and white image and your camera was exposing for this really bright, really hot white flower, which is why in the background shadows here, uh, your camera settings didn't allow any light to, uh, to hit the sensor from the, uh, the background elements and it's very dark and that creates a beautiful contrast. We are, again, we are seeing the foreground in all its beauty here because you paid mind to your background. This is not not an example of color palette, but, but light, um, light balance. And in general, your foreground should always be brighter than your background or rather your subject should always be brighter than your background. Um, this shot by uh, Yonatan who does street portraiture, I could tell that it was his before I saw the watermark. Um, this I think is a tad too dark. He does seem to be in the shade. He seems to maybe have an orange overhang. Um, but there also is a beautiful color palette here. There's the, the, it has like an orange tone in general. Um, I mean, look at this beautiful soft background. It's not this gorgeous girl here that's making the photo. It's the it's the it's the subtle beautiful palette behind her that's allowing her to be seen. That's what's making the photo. That's what separates a professional photographer from an amateur one. Is you're not throwing the camera up to your eye and taking a photo but you're creating something. You're, you're looking at everything. You're looking at the interplay of light and shadow and color and foreground and background. I mean, look at this beautiful image. We have a light green on the bottom. We have the subjects popping out this orangey brown mushrooms that are coming out from the green, okay? Then we have this sandwiched here, another light, blurred, beautifully bokeh green <laughs> behind it. Then we have a dark layer. This is a total striations of, of layers here of colors and light. And then on top, we have this gray white, which is light. You know, I'm just using my imagination here, which is, you know, sun coming through trees. Your imagination starts filling in the blanks of what that background is. But this, the fact that this line here exists, the fact that it's a straight line, that is super important. This is beautifully composed. The subject is just under the half mark. It's, it's elegant. It's crafted. Um, also, this has tones of orange and blue. This is just gorgeous. So I really hope that you guys are, are opening your eyes to color, to how these photos are, this is giving like a brown and a blue. And the reason why I felt that this challenge would be able to bring out this lesson the most is because by nature, depth of field is blurring out everything else. You're focusing on one element, usually a small element in the photo, and the blur is taking away the form, right? And that just leaves the color. That just leaves the color palette. So I feel like it's so much clearer to see these beautiful colors. And uh, I really am just so astonished with with what you guys did with this theme. I mean, this this is a painting, you know, just red and green. Again, if you had something in the background here or on the side here in the foreground that was not red or green, it just wouldn't be the same. You looked at this scene and you made sure 
that frame to frame, corner to corner, you are only including the colors that you see in this frame, in this composition. And it's a really, really uh, good job. Really, really excellently done all around. This, I, I would imagine, was an overcast day because these colors are just popping. This, this is really beautiful light, very special image. This is absolutely incredible. I, this is a bit distracting here, right? The color palette, soft blue, which brings out this amazing bird's face, whatever bird this is. <laughs> um, I feel like an idiot when I talk about nature because I'm from New York and I don't know, like... I know like the yellow cabs and 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 <laughs> meat trucks. I don't know uh, what kind of bird this is. Um, I would have cropped it something like this. And it's not just because it's an extremely interesting subject, but look at how I changed the color palette by zooming in. I'm zooming in a bit too much, but it's the color. We're not seeing any other colors now. And this this blue is what attracts me to this, this is the balance this is how I see it the color of this particular photograph and the greens are nice too don't get me wrong but ultimately I think this may be a little bit distracting not that you could have done it differently but I'm just pointing out um, this here and this super bright um, part of the grass here now maybe this was a you know once in a lifetime shot and you got it and like that was the best you could do uh, I don't mean to cr critique this gorgeous shot and I'm not saying I would do better I'm just trying to uh, bring a, a lesson here that we can see from looking at this that ultimately the less distracting your palette is this is just the, a beautiful palette of browns um, red and greens orange and blue look at this layer green to blue so the less distracting your palette is the the nicer your composition is the more intentional it looks and the more pleasing it will be to the viewers eye um, yeah, this, this brown in the background just perfectly complements the brown here and the green to the green, uh, and, and he's w way brighter than the rest of the scene. So you're, the eye is drawn to him first, you know, red and green, red, like this bird's eye looks red. Now, I don't know if it's red, maybe it would be a different color in, in a different light, but that's what's popping because you've naturally framed this bird with red. And then you've taken out all of the other distraction because you're shooting into a very well lit. The sun is directly on your subject, so the background is totally black. Very much like Al's shot before. So, I mean, this is just beautiful color. This is just a magnificent composition. Again, orange and blue, beautiful. Like, you know, you, 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 you work towards a color palette also that really invokes an emotion. I mean, this to me is, is fall. It looks very dry. You have that that orangey brown fall look, right? I'm getting a bit into style and fashion. I mean, that's where it comes from. These colors uh, invoke emotion. All right, guys. Um, I, I feel like that was a 10-minute uh, a rant, but a, a hopefully a, a positive one. I mean, these photos that I, that I took out, I think are absolutely uh, stunning and a really impeccable example of some beautiful aspects of, of intentionality and color. And, um, you know, this, for example, and man, I, I'm not such a fan of spiders, but is it just me? Like, they look really cute when they're close up, These all these alien eyeballs. Um, like this spider, it's di distracting this, this band of shadowing here. If maybe you wait until he crawled into the center of this pattern and you got just the spider and the pattern. And just this pattern went end to end, frame to frame. Imagine the spider here in the middle, let's say. Um, you know, I think once you start seeing, and again, this wouldn't come into play as easily with uh, street photography and things like that, but you can keep it in mind because the next time you're walking down the street and you see a woman, let's say, wearing red and you see down the block there is a wall that's green, maybe you'd run down the block slap on a zoom lens, wait until she passes the green wall. You know, that's I mean, that's an extreme scenario. But my point is you, you can see it. You can shift your position and shift your focal length and create a color palette in whatever scene is in front of you. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this screencast critique. I hope you enjoyed the lessons that I gave. Again, thank you so much to our Patreon, Patreon patrons 
for uh, for really supporting the project. It warms my heart. It means so much. And if for some reason you're listening to this and you don't know what 52 frames is, then uh, I applaud you for uh, blindly <laughs> watching this. But definitely check out 52frames.com to get started for our free and forever free weekly photography challenge. Until next time, you guys, happy shooting. <laughs>